Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash nerdery and murdery. That's betterhelp.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. All right. It is recording. There is a dog licking itself behind you. Hey! <laughs> There's your stab. <laughs> There's your stab for this week. There is a dog <laughs> licking itself right behind you. Nice. Hey! Welcome to episode 44 of Nerdery and Murdery. 44. Uh, we're recording this episode back in our podcast Wayback Machine, where we just finished uh, and released our two-parter episode with two geeks and a microphone. That was a lot of fun. Wanted to say thanks to Mike and Steven for being with us. It was a blast to record with another show. Uh, hope everyone takes a listen on their show as they geek out as much as we do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, they do. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, yes. I am Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdery. Uh, we're over here starting to defrost from a mini snowmageddon year two. We, we don't do ice down here in Texas real well, so that's always a fun time. And, uh, you it's know, with frightening. It, yeah. And so with the roads not being great, we're coming to you again with another Zoom recording and wanted to welcome Will back to the show after a couple of weeks of him being away. Welcome back, Will. Yay. So, uh, Zig, if you want to take over on the nerdery side of the house. Well, awesome. Um, today, we're going to talk about Patrick Troughton. Patrick Troughton is the second doctor. Awesome. Do you realize that was 10 episodes ago you did your first doctor? Really? Yep. Huh. We should keep that up. 
Okay. We got 13 to go. So sure. Why not? So Patrick George Troughton uh, was born on uh, March 25th, 1920 and passed away on March 28th, 1987. Uh, he was an English actor. He was classically trained for the stage, but became most widely known for his role in television and film. His works included appearances in several sa fantasy, science fiction, and horror films, and played the second incarnation of the Doctor in the long-running British science fiction television series, Doctor Who, from 1966 to 1969. Uh, he reprised the role in 1972 to 1973, the Five Doctors special, and then 1983 and 1985. Um, so in 1966, uh, the Doctor Who producer, uh, Eines Lloyd, who took over from uh, Verity Lambert, uh, was looking for a replacement for William Hartnell in the series. Um, the continued survival of the show depended on an audience accepting another actor in the role. So despite the bold decision that the replacement would not be a Hartnell lookalike or sound alike, Lloyd later stated that Hartnell had approved of the choice of saying there's only one man in England who can take over, and that's Pat Troughton. Lloyd chose Troughton because of his extensive and versatile experience as a character actor. Um, after he was cast, Troughton considered various ways to approach the role uh, to differentiate his portrayal from Hartnell's amiable yet tetchy patriarch. Uh, Troughton's early thoughts about how he might play the Doctor included a tough sea captain, um, which is a, like a pirate figure, uh, in blackface and a turban which oh, disturbing. No. Yeah. yeah, that was one of his ideas. Yeah, that quickly got canned. Yeah. And Doctor Who creator Sidney Newman suggested the Doctor could be like a cosmic hobo, uh, sort of like Charlie Chaplin. And that is what they chose, you know, sort of a Chaplin-esque figure who's, you know, kind of a cosmic tramp. And what year was this? 66. Okay. Troughton was the first Doctor to have his face appear in the opening title of the show. Because that didn't happen before him, you know, where the 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 tunnel goes out mm -hmm. and your face pops up. Patrick Trout was the first one to do that, which they don't really do that much anymore. They don't do it anymore now. No, but they did it from like 66 to 89. Yeah. Yeah. Because they didn't do it in the in the 96 movie and they haven't done it since the beginning so, or the beginning of the new series. In, in one of the serials, The Enemy of the World, Troughton played two parts, uh, the protagonist, the Doctor, and the, and the antagonist, Salamander. So the thing was, the, the Doctor looked exactly like this, this character, Salamander. Uh, and that was actually taken from, um, uh, I think it was Jewel Verne novel where, uh, called The Master of the World, where this guy was riding around in a blimp controlling the world. Not a great novel. Uh, I think it's actually a novella, but they, they liked the idea, so they, they gave it this. Now, during his time in the series, uh, Trout tended to shun publicity and rarely gave interviews. He told one interviewer, I think acting is magic. If I tell you all about myself, it will spoil it for you. Years later, he told another interviewer that his greatest concern was that too much publicity would limit his opportunities as a character actor after he left the role of Doctor Who. Now, some of the other things he's done um, after Doctor Who are um, really kind of uh, surprising. Um, Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. Uh, he played an old Greek alchemist, um, Menel Thias, mm -hmm. Alana Thias, a hermit on the island of Kasgar who is said to know how, how to break curses. And in Jason and the Argonauts, he played Phineas, who was blinded and is tormented by harpies for – misusing Zeus's gift of prophecy. Um, it basically, um, he played an old man in Jason and the Argonauts, and he actually was an old man in Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger. But the makeup is pretty close. Um, he also was in The Omen. He oh, played Father the Bre Yeah, the, the original, original Omen. Okay. Yeah, he played Father Brennan, a Catholic oh. priest who warns Robert and Damien's of, about Ro Damien's origins. I love The Omen. That's... Yeah. That's that's another one of those movies that could go up into uh, into top horror movies for me. Yeah. The Omen is just scary. Yeah, it's pretty frightening. A lot of good jump scares in The Omen, too. Yes. Um, now, uh, the, uh, Father Brennan warned Robert about Damien's origins and hinting that he is not human and insisting that Robert accept Christ as his savior and take communion. He later tells Robert that Catherine is pregnant, that Damien is the son of Satan, 
and then he will kill his unborn sibling as well as his parents, and that he must die. Immediately afterwards, Brennan is fatally impaled by a pole falling from a church roof. During a oh, I remember that scene. That is Patrick Troughton. Oh, okay. I, I can't see Patrick Troughton in my head, but I, oh, that scene I remember yeah. well from the open. So in a rare interview with Ernest Thompson's from the Radio Times, Troughton revealed that he always liked dressing up and he would be happy as a school teacher um, as children keep, keep one young. Troughton was popular with both the production team and his co-stars. Producer Lloyd uh, credited Troughton with a leading actor's temperament. He was a father figure to the whole company, and hence he could embrace it and sweep it along with him. Uh, Troughton also gained a reputation on set as a practical joker. Many of the early episodes in which Troughton appeared were, uh, were among those that were discarded by the BBC. Remember we talked about how they would – they needed more they, – they were afraid they weren't going to have room on the tapes. Yeah. 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 Troughton uh, – did find the Doctor Who schedule at the time, 40 to 44 episodes per year, a little grueling, and decided to leave oh the series. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it ran all year. Uh, he decided to leave the series in 1969 after three years in the role. The decision was also motivated in part by being typecast because you don't want to play that too long. Mm -hmm. uh, he did return to Doctor Who three times after formally leaving the program, um, basically playing the character of the second Doctor. Um. The first of these was in The Three Doctors, uh, the 1972-1973 serial opening the program's 10th season. And then 1983, the 20th anniversary, which is The Five Doctors. Uh, and that was at the request of series producer John Nathan Turner that he actually come back and do it. He also agreed to attend Doctor Who conventions, including the show's 20th anniversary. Now, in the, uh, <clears throat> the specials, he and uh, John Pertwee – had a contentious relationship. Or the second and the third doctor had contentious relationships with each other in the series. Uh, uh, Troughton would, or the second doctor would call the third doctor a fancy pants, and the third doctor would call the second doctor a hobo. The two actors really kind of played this up because they, they were actually quite good friends. And at conventions, uh, it was not uncommon for them to have water gun fights yeah. around through the audience, just They'd be introducing him, and they would run in with water pistols, just capping each other with across across the audience to get as many people wet as they could. So, so go back just real quick. So, so he did the doctor for three years again, mm -hmm. uh, three years, but at sixty six to sixty nine. But at this point, they hadn't decided it was going to be three years. It was two actors, one that had to leave because of health issues mm -hmm. and the other because he done, he wanted to be typecast. Was it this point they decided three years is enough or or uh, no, they actually they, they left it up to the actors. Okay. Uh, and in most actors decided on the, the three seasons ruling out. Now, the two exceptions would be. Uh, John Pertwee, who did it for five seasons, mm -hmm. and Tom Baker, who did it for seven. Mm -hmm. But then Peter Dav Davidson only did three, and Colin Baker only did three, and uh, Sylvester McCoy only did three. And then all the new iterations, except for um, Chris Eccleston. Chris Eccleston. Chris Eccleston only did one. Right. And But since him, everybody has done three seasons. Right. I just I, I just wasn't sure if if that was kind of the hard rule then that they decided or but you nope. but OK, gotcha. yeah, they left it up to the actors um, and they just wanted to keep it rolling. Um, now, in uh, 2013, the BBC commissioned a docudrama about the early days of Doctor Who, which we talked about in the first episode uh, or the, the first Doctor episode, sorry, um, as part of the fifth program's 50th anniversary celebration. Uh, Troughton appeared as a character in the production called An Adventure in Space and Time, and he was portrayed by the actor Reese Shearsmith. Uh, and the 2014 Robots of Sherwood, a still image of Tr Troughton from 1953, appeared among the future depictions of Robin Hood displayed by the 12th Doctor to the outlaw. Um, the, second, the second Doctor is an incarnation of the Doctor, uh, the protagonist of the BBC science fiction television program, Doctor Who. Um, portrayed by Patrick Troughton. While the Troughton era of Doctor Who is well-remembered by fans, that era's Doctor Who literature, it is difficult to apprise in full because of his 119 episodes. As of the time of these notes, 53 are still missing. Wow. Yeah. Um, 
So, you know, Doctor Who in general, uh, the series narrative says the Doctor Who is a centuries old alien, a uh, time lord from the planet Gallifrey who travels in space and time in his TARDIS, frequently with companions. And at the end of his life, he regenerates. And as a result, the physical appearance and personality of the Doctor changes. The transformation into the second Doctor, originally referred to as a renewal, uh, figure was the same essential character at first, but was a very different persona. Uh, he was he was a turning point in the evolution of the series. So basically, when uh, when Patrick Troughton woke up as the Doctor, it was uh, the show was really off and running. He took it in a completely new direction. Everything we think of as Doctor Who kind of comes from the Troughton era. Well, and, and to, to, to go forward just a little bit, a, a rumor I saw this week and, you know, take it with a grain of salt, of course, but there's yeah. there's now a rumor that David Tennant might come back as the doctor. Yeah, they they have done that. Like every time there's a new doctor takeover, there's several rumors. I want to say that Rupert Grint has been in the is been yeah. in the rumor mill every time they make a change right um and it was that way in the be uh in the beginning too they always after Troughton, it was like well it, it it'll be this guy no one ever has it quite right mm -hmm. so anytime you get those rumors yeah that would be interesting but you never know what it's going to be because i think there were several people and they would allude to this person being the doctor and then they would end up coming in and playing a villain uh, mm -hmm. Valentine Dial, uh, I believe I'm saying that actor's name is correct. He ended up playing the white and black guardians in the Tom Baker era. He was rumored to be the doctor on two or three occasions, but he ended up coming in and doing the show. So you, you never can't tell. They'll end up using those people, but uh, they even talked about having a uh, a female doctor as far back as the 70s. Right. That's that's always been rumored for a long time yeah. is to have a female doctor. Um, now, with uh, Troughton's companions, uh, when he first woke up, he had the swinging 60s socialite named Polly and a working class sailor named Ben Jackson. And they were the last two people who were with uh, Hartnell. And when he woke up, that's who, that, those are the companions he had. Uh, they were later joined by an 18th century Jacobite, Jamie McCrimmon, uh, played by Fraser Hines, uh, the Scotsman. He was with Patrick Troughton through the rest of his time. That's uh, another that's another uh, point of interest. Do all the companions that are with the last regeneration go on with the next doctor for a short time or is it ever so, completely cut off? Sometimes, uh, um, as a matter of fact, at the end of Patrick Troughton's uh, at the end of Patrick Troughton's uh, tenure as the Doctor, uh, both of those companions go away. Okay. Because the Time Lords uh, force Patrick Troughton to uh, to regenerate and get stuck on Earth, and they return his two companions back to where he pulled them out of time. Um, and that happens a lot too, where the Doctor returns the companions to yes. their point in time where he originally picked them up. Yes. Yes, that happens a lot. Um, oh, and sometimes, it, you know, like with Elizabeth Sladen, he drops her off in her uh, in Croydon and she w looks around. She's like, this isn't Croydon. Well, and sometimes, unfortunately, companions meet fateful ends. Yes. Yes. Uh, Adric uh, died in a starship crash. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. I think they've killed some off in the new series, too. Right. Clara. Yeah, that's right, Clara. She, come, she comes back, but they do kill her off at one uh -huh. point. Bill Potts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she got turned into a Cyberman, a Mondasian Cyberman, um, which is the original. The original idea of the Cybermen were from the planet Mondas, which is the 10th planet, um, which is in a parahedral. Is that right? Am I saying that right? It's exactly on the sure. opposite side, side of the sun as the Earth. That's sure, why we can't I'll, see it. I'll, I'll go with that. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, the first Doctor grew progressively weaker while battling the Cybermen uh, during the events of the Ten Planet and eventually collapsed, seemingly from old age. His body renewed itself 
renewed and transformed into the second doctor. Uh, I don't think they called it regeneration until um, until Troughton regenerated into Pertwee. Now, uh, initially, the relationship between the second doctor and his predecessor was unclear. In the first story, the second doctor referred to his pre predecessor in the third person as if he were a completely different person. Now, the companion has been in Polly are at first unsure how to treat him, and it's only when a Dalek recognizes him that they accept that he is the doctor. Uh, this all occurred during the new doctor's first story, The Power of the Daleks. Uh, it was in the second story, The Highlanders, that uh, he picked up Jamie McCrimmon. Now, Jamie McCrimmon, he may be the longest serving companion. You know, the more I think about it, well, no, no, because Sarah Jane did, did like over three seasons, like three and a half. Right. And Jamie McCrimmon did two, two seasons and, and most of a third. So, yeah, I've said before in a previous episode, it felt like to me that Rose Tyler was, was long with, doctor who but apparently not yeah no no she 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 was i think she did yeah two seasons but she came back a couple of times uh multiple times actually and i love that she came back as so yeah i think uh rose she came uh, and the actress came back as the uh as the doomsday weapon the the conscience of the the conscience of the the bomb what was it and, called and who was this that came back um in the 50th anniversary uh the actress um that played rose tyler came back as uh oh billy piper yes billy piper she came back as the 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 the, the bomb yeah it was yeah. the bomb itself yeah yeah so i mean she did come back quite a bit and you know sarah jane came back for a couple of episodes as well as her own series hmm. yeah oh yeah i knew yeah i knew sarah jane did that yeah uh now um Ben and Polly left together when the TARDIS landed at Gatwick Airport on the same day that they originally left with the first doctor after they had stopped the mass kidnapping of tourists by shape-shifting aliens. In the following story, the evil of the Daleks, the doctor and Jamie became involved in a plot by the Daleks to gain both the human and Dalek factors. When the TARDIS was stolen, which led them to meeting Victoria Wakefield in the 19th century, the doctor used the situation to in engineer a dalek civil war that seemingly destroyed the daleks forever how many times has that happened right um victoria's father was among the casualties uh now that she was an orphan victoria chose to accompany the doctor and jamie on their travels although she felt great affection for the doctor and jamie she was never able to completely come to terms with life in the tardis and the constant danger that resulted she eventually chose to leave after the events of fury from the deep and was adopted by Mr. and Mrs. Harris in the 20th century. Wow. To go from the 19th to the to the middle of the 20th century, could you imagine? Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, uh, go from the earliest 20th, 20th century to now. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at the leaps and bounds of technology we've had between, you know, say 19... Uh, oh, gosh, let's go 1922 yeah. to 2022. My gosh. Yeah. 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 It would be like living on a futuristic planet. Right. Um, the doctor and Jamie were joined by Zoe Harriet, an extremely intelligent woman from the 21st century who helped defeat the Cybermen attack on a space station known as the wheel. She then stowed away in the TARDIS and despite the doctor's warnings about what she might encounter, she chose to remain. Now, during his second incarnation, the doctor confronted uh, familiar foes such as the Daleks and the Cybermen as well as new enemies such as the Great Intelligence and the Ice Warriors. Uh, it was during the Web of Fear that he first met Colonel, Colonel Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart in the tunnels of the London Underground. Following the defeat of the Great Intelligence, Lethbridge Stewart was promoted to Brigadier and became the leader of the British contingent of UNIT, which is a military organization tasked to investigate and defend the world from extraterrestrial threats. In the invasion, the doctor retreated with him to defeat an enemy or an invasion of Cybermen in league with the industrialist Tobias Vaughn. So the first time we see the Brigadier is actually with um, Patrick Troughton. Um, but he only gets two seri uh, serials with, with the Brigadier. The Brigadier spent a lot more time with John Pertwee and 
Actually, he spent quite a bit of time with Tom Baker, too. That's, Tom Baker. that's what I thought. I thought I remembered that character from Tom Baker. Yes, yes. He was, he was, matter of fact, the, the opening of the, the, the third Doctor's uh, first episode, it, it opens with Lethbridge Stewart hiring a scientist. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't see the Doctor for the first 10, 15 minutes. That's Spearhead from Space, which was also the first color episode. Like none of the mm. Patrick Troughton episodes were in color. That didn't start until John Pertwee took over in 1970. Um, and I can I can say this with all authority. The cinematographers for the BBC did not know how to use color. It took them a good season to a season and a half to really get how to use because everything looks really flat if you go back and watch spearhead from space which is a i know we're jumping the gun here but the first color episode the john pertwee episode you go back and watch spearhead from space everything is washed out they don't know how to dress the set for color either if that makes sense Mm -hmm. Uh, oh absolutely i mean i i know for 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 the black and white they were very versed in in how to color the set uh to to bring out certain things in, you know, uh, 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 around the set. Uh, I love Lucy is a big example of that yeah. is they used a lot of various colors around the set to make it pop in black and white. Yes. And then the first, you know, the first time you see that stuff in color, it looks awful. Right. Doctor who was the same way. Um, that spearhead from space is, I don't want to say it's unwatchable because it's still a really gripping, good story. Plus you get uh, Carolyn Johns as Liz Shaw and you really get to see uh, Nicholas Courtney as Brigadier Alistair Lethbridge Stewart really kind of work his chops, you know, and that Nicholas Courtney was great in that role. I can't imagine anybody else being uh, Lethbridge Stewart, Mm -hmm. you know, and he just, he inhabited it, um, but it's really good to go back and check out the the first black black and white episodes. Matter of fact, I want to say it. I don't think it was the invasion. I think it was the Web of Fear, where he first meets Lethbridge Stewart. That's one of the ones that they found recently. So we've got all of those episodes. Oh, circling back as we do. In the final story, the War Games, the second Doctor. Uh, the second doctor's time came to an end when the TARDIS landed in the middle of a war zone created by a race of alien warlords who, with the help of a renegade time lord, the war chief, progressively kidnapped and brainwashed humans into becoming soldiers for them, uh, hoping to use uh, the ones who survived to conquer the galaxy. Now, although the doctor was able to defeat their plans, he realized he would be unable to return the human subjects to the various or original points in Earth's history. So that's when he contacted the Time Lords, and uh, that's when he was basically put on trial. And they're like, uh, "You know what? We're going to uh, we're going to take away your knowledge of how to travel in time. We're going to fix your tires where it won't travel in time. We're going to take away this regeneration, and we're going to strand you on Earth. Since you like it so much, why don't you stay there?" Um. Because he he transgressed the laws of non-interference. He broke mm-hmm. the prime directive, essentially. Right. Um, and despite the doctor's arguments that the Time Lords should use their great powers to help people, he was sentenced to exile on 20th century Earth. Um, Jamie and Zoe were returned to their own times, and their memories of all but their first encounter with the doctor were wiped. Uh, and the secrets of the TARDIS were also taken away from the doctor. Uh, that was season six. B is the way they called it. Now, there were uh, what appeared to be continuity errors in Troughton's later appearances, particularly the two doctors. Some fans have speculated that the Time Lords used the second doctor as an agent after the end of the war games and that he did not, in fact, immediately regenerate. Because later on, you get a you get an episode in the late 80s called The Two Doctors where – um. Colin Baker stumbles across the second doctor and Jamie just kind of, you know, working a, working a mission as it were. Did uh, they have another episode called the two doctors with uh, David Tennant and Matt Smith? Or was that called something different? 
That, I think that was called something different. Okay. That was the 50th anniversary. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Now, the second, di- uh, the second Doctor's Regeneration was also depicted in Devious, a fan-produced film starring John Pertwee in his last appearance as the third Doctor. Um, they also did quite a few comics with him in it. He was kind of a – in the literature and in the, in the novels and stuff and the comics, he was kind of a favorite for writers – I guess because he was that kind of cosmic hobo mm-hmm. sort of doctor. Um, and according to the script editor, Robert Holmes, the second doctor's mission for the Time Lords uh, took place prior to the events of the war games uh, that they framed. Uh, the Troughton doctor got him to do various things for him, and they hauled him up in front of them on trial, uh, kind of like the McCarthy trials. That was kind of his idea, his take on it. Um, now, the second doctor had been nicknamed the cosmic hobo and the impish second doctor because he was scruffy and childlike mercurial clever and always a few steps ahead of his enemies which again that's what kind of becomes the the doctor's trademark he's the smartest person in there or she is the smartest person in the room it's like okay what have i got i've got this i've got this i got this yeah i can go with that and they just figure out how to do things and i asked it I asked it in the previous episode and I I apologize. I don't remember. We still at this point don't have the sonic screwdriver. No, he actually starts using the sonic screwdriver. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I want to say there's a couple of episodes with him where he uses the sonic screwdriver. Um, He also has a recorder that he likes to play Mm -hmm. Um, for some reason. Um, I always think of the doctor playing the recorder and, captain picard playing his little flute one of my favorite star trek episodes (laughs) the one that makes you cry yes now uh the great intelligence doesn't come back and i i'm surprised it's basically a i haven't really explained whether it's a, a machine intelligence or a great non corporeal being but it's 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 bent on malevolent plans it comes up a lot in the second doctor stories um this doctor is the first doctor to be associated with the catch phrase when i say run run <laughs> and oh my giddy aunt although the letter the latter is only first heard in his last few stories but yeah like the crotons he's noted for rep- and the, I'm sorry, the serial, the Crotons is the first time that you see him playing that recorder. Um, now, Troughton's costume was a result from discussions between the actor, the producer, Eines Lloyd, and the script editor, uh, Jerry Davis. Uh, he wore a black frock coat, which we would call an overcoat, uh, and it was too big. He had a light blue colored button down collared shirt, and the top button was always undone, and that top of the shirt was held uh, together with a safety pin attached to a Winch- Winston Churchill stop Winston Churchill style bow tie Ugh, it's hard to read he wore very very baggy checked trousers uh, and he either held them up with red uh, suspenders with uh, stars moons and flowers or uh, white suspenders with a navy stripe down the middle and the first two stories they were held up his pants were held up by a piece of rope so do all the doctors the 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 various iterations of doctors do all of them get to have their hand in the costume i have always heard that um with the exception of peter davidson and colin baker they said they didn't get a they didn't get any input at all Hmm. other than peter davidson's well i do like to play cricket so they gave him that cricket at, cricketer outfit, which is wrong, mm-hmm. um, as he's often said. It's it's yes, it's a cricketer's outfit, but it's not the right. It's like a, it's like you took a regular cricket uh, cricketing outfit from the 1920s and did a 1980s take on it. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't correct. Um, the uh, and Colin Baker hated the jet. What what Colin Baker wanted to do was wear a sweater with a black leather jacket over it, which is what which is what Christopher Eccleston ended up wearing with his head shaved. He thought that was the way to go for the doctor. It turns out he was right. 
Yeah, I thought I, I, I love Chris Nicholson as the doctor. Yeah, yeah, that was a great look for him. Uh, but they made him put on that awful, awful coat, you know, the patchwork coat, which is what he was most known for. But yeah, I, I apparently Tom Baker got to got to give some uh, give some input into his outfit, and he was basically the last one till Sylvester McCoy. Sylvester McCoy was able to go, hey, you know, I wear I like to wear hats. I've got a lot of hats. You know, I like I like cool umbrellas. I've got he had to, I think he, I want to say he's the one that had the question mark umbrella made because it's a walking cane and an umbrella. But the handle is a question mark. Mm -hmm. um, God, I wouldn't mind having one of those, but I want to say it's a one off. If you if you make it, it's going to have to be if if you get one, it's going to have to be bespoke because they don't really make umbrellas that can be used as canes anymore. Um, now, his style brought younger audiences to the show. The second doctor's tenure was characterized by a faster pace and a preference towards monsters of the week or BEMs as they were referred to big eye or bug eyed monsters. Um, the purely historical adventures that were recurring feature with William Hartnell kind of stopped happening. They, they quit going back in history um, after Jamie, you know, they, 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 they got, they picked up Trevor Hines and they didn't really go back into the past much anymore. And they didn't, they didn't go back into the past as a historical drama until um, there was a Peter Davison episode. The Black Orchid was the next time they did one. So they didn't they didn't do another go back in history and do a purely historical drama until 20 years later. Um, he would still go to the Earth's, Earth's past, but it was all in the. It was all on the point of a science fiction story. It was during this era that Doctor Who began to come under fire for its purportedly violent and frightening content. I would say it made the show better. And if you go back and watch it, some of that stuff is a little scary, uh, even though it's in black and white. But the Doctor always comes out in the end. It wasn't too frightening. Uh, that was kind of that was kind of a, a, a British rite of passage when you could watch the doctor without hiding behind the couch. <laughs> That's, you know, once you were able to sit on the couch as opposed to hiding behind it, poking your head out to watch Doctor Who, that's that's when you became a big kid in, in England for a long time. So the only two stories in Troughton's first season, the Tomb of the Cyberman and the Enemy of the World still exist in their entirety. That That amazes me. Yeah. Ten stories only exist partially, uh, most with uh, two episodes out of the four six and four lost in their entirety. His first story, The Power of the Daleks, Jamie's first adventure of the Highlanders, the Makratera, and Victoria's last adventure, Fury from the Deep, are gone. They have not been able to find them. Like I said, they have found some. They found two complete stories in a TV, a little tv uh station down and i want to say it was like zimbabwe or something and they were they were amazed that they were still in great shape because this this place had been closed for like 10 15 years wow. but they were yeah yeah they went into well we need to go ahead and they were re redoing the build and it's like oh oh hey we found some doctor who tapes oh hey we found some lost doctor who tapes so they sent them back to the bbc it took them like a year to clean them up too but yeah that is basically it for the second doctor cool I, I I really like these. I like learning about the old doctors because, like I said, you're more familiar with them than I am because Chris Eccleston is my first doctor and I can't wait till we hit there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, techni technically Tom Baker is, but yeah. but I didn't watch those regularly because, as we talked about in a previous episode, I had a hard time staying with them because you would have an episode that was a half hour. Then you'd have an episode that was two hours. And I just, I just couldn't stay yeah. with it. So, Oh yeah. Those six parters are, you know, close to three hours long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Chris Eccleston was really when I really got into the doctor. So I, I enjoy uh, hearing about the past and the doctors uh, from someone who's as versed as you are with him. So great. Well, and un unfortunately there's not, there's not a lot of, of of actual material on 
Patrick Troughton and and and, and uh, uh, William oh Hartnell. God. Thank you, William Hartnell. <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> gone. That's all right. A lot of lot of info you got to keep in your head anyway. So yeah, great. Thank you. Good well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So then with that, uh, we'll step over to the murdery side of the house. Murder. Uh, with this, we're going to be talking, or I'm sorry, let me go back to my references. Uh, I got my information today off Pro Death Penalty, uh, Evil Kin, Season 3, Episode 6, Deadly DNA, Murderpedia, Law and Mind, and the New York Times, and this is the story of Jeffrey Landrigan. Jeffrey Landrigan. Yes, okay. sir. So we're going to start in 1962 with Nick and Dot Landrigan. They were living in Oklahoma, and, and they were making money from the oil boom. Uh, Nick was an engineer, and Dot was a stay-at-home mom to their eight-year-old daughter, Bethany. And, and Bethany was the picture of a perfect child. She never got in trouble in school. Uh, or she never got in trouble, period. Uh, and she was good in school. But, you know, she she really wanted a sibling and the Landrigans really wanted to give Bethany one. But Dot couldn't. She she couldn't have children. She had miscarriages every time that they tried to have children. So they decided to adopt. And later in 1962, they were able to adopt a 11 month year old baby named Jeffrey. By six years old. Jeffrey was acting out and showing signs of trouble. He had temper tantrums, violent outbursts. Uh, he would act out at home in school and he would steal and, and really just show that he was really kind of a bad kid. Um, the temper tantrums started at two years old and his drinking problems began at 10. Good Lord. You know, and, and as you can expect, this was very foreign to the Landrigans because, you know, they had a, such a good child with Bethany. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult for them to understand Jeffrey. Uh, once he was caught shoplifting a knife and he was asked why he did it, and his answer was, I don't know, it just seemed like the thing to do. Um, Jeffrey, good Lord. Yeah. And, and they say they picked him up when he was 11 months old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he once said, Jeffrey once said that he felt love, but he never really felt like he belonged. Um, but what the Landrigans didn't know is that Jeffrey came from a long line of criminals. So we're going to turn back the clock 14 years and to Jeffrey's biological father that he never knew, Daryl Hill. Daryl Hill came from a family of bootleggers. Uh, he was a criminal. He was a drug addict. Uh, at 15, Daryl was co convicted of stealing a car and sent to the Oklahoma State Penitentiary, 15 years old. Wow. Um, he quickly realized in prison that he was in a sea of sharks, and he was approached one day by another prisoner who was going to attempt to rape Daryl. Daryl had made a shiv, and he pulled it out, and he stabbed the man. Uh, he claimed self-defense and was not convicted of homicide. Uh, and then would serve another three years in prison before being released. Um, he returned home at 21 years old to find 15-year-old uh, Desiree Flowers now living there, and she was the daughter of his mother's new husband. Daryl and Desiree quickly ended up in a sexual relationship and doing drugs together, and then ended up marrying a few months later. Um, that's when Desiree got pregnant with Jeffrey. But this pregnancy did not change Daryl or Desiree's behavior. They were both hard drinkers uh, and hard drug users, even during the pregnancy. Neither of the two had jobs. So Daryl went out making money any way he could, such as stealing, robbing and committing burglaries. Uh, he once used uh, the, uh, the baby's crib as a hiding spot for both his drugs and his 38. Nice. <sighs> Uh, Daryl was also very hot-tempered, and he would commit uh, acts of domestic violence against Desiree. Uh, he would be arrested in 62 for burglary, leaving Desiree alone with the baby. And Desiree knew she was in no fit shape to raise a baby, so she put up Jeffrey for adoption, which we know the Landrigans adopted him from there. Mm -hmm. In 1964, Daryl was released from prison. Desiree had divorced him while he was in prison, but he tried to reunite with his wife and his, you know, his child that he never knew. 
Um, while Daryl was away, Desiree attempted to clean up her life and she didn't want Daryl searching for uh, Jeffrey. So she lied and told Daryl that Jeffrey was dead from a fire that he didn't survive. This unfortunately sent Daryl in a downward spiral and he's eventually arrested for armed robbery and sentenced to 18 years in prison. 18 years. Yep. Um, so back to 1972, 10 years old, Jeffrey learns that he's adopted. Uh, some of his classmates found out about it before he did, and he was teased for it. Uh, he confirmed this when he found his adoption papers in the house, and he felt very betrayed and lied to uh, from his parents because he felt that his whole life was a lie. Okay. And this, unfortunately, would turn him to worse behaviors in his teen years, and he was committing burglaries and doing drugs, picking right up where his father, Daryl, left off. In 1978, after spending a majority of his life behind bars, uh, Daryl starts to deteriorate mentally. Uh, he starts having hallucinations and violent outbursts, and he is then transferred to the state's mental institution to serve out the remainder of his sentence. But this facility is not overly secure and Daryl one day just walked out. Just walked right out. Yep. On February 7th, 1980, 200 miles away in Pencil Bluff, Arkansas, Daryl stole a car and was high on meth, gripping a loaded gun. He needed more money for drugs. And so he pulled into a gas station at 2 PM and finds EL Ward alone in the gas station. Uh, Daryl tells EL to give him all the money. And while EL is handing over, uh, handing over everything in the cash register, a game and fish officer named Donald Teague comes in. Daryl pointed the gun at both men and told him to get in his car and that they were going for a ride. Uh, Daryl forced Donald to drive, and then he had them drive to a secluded location before having Donald pull over. Daryl forced both men to get on the ground with their hands behind their head and then shot both men multiple times, killing Donald. Uh, EL actually survived by playing dead and he crawled on his hands and knees to the highway where he's picked up by a passing trucker. Uh, he was able to give uh, a description to authorities of Daryl, the car he's driving and the kind of gun he has. And the police spot Daryl's vehicle just two hours later, at which point he was quickly caught with, uh, with the gun and the cash in the car. And on July 11th, 1980, he's convicted of murder and given the death penalty. In 1981, Jeffrey, now 19, uh, he was battling an out-of-control drug problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick and Dot, his adoptive parents, uh, sent Jeffrey to a rehab facility in Austin, Texas, hoping that they could rehabilitate him. Uh, while in treatment, he met another patient named Amy Lansky, and they both successfully complete the program, and then Jeffrey then proposed to Amy. They then returned to, uh, to, <clears throat> excuse me, to their home in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Nick and Dot's home. And, and Nick and Dot were really not happy with the situation. They, they felt that this would simply return Jeffrey to his old habits. Yeah, isn't the, uh, don't they tell the, or isn't it highly suggested in a 12 step program that you not engage in a relationship for at least a year not only that but they recommend for that first year you not engage in a relationship with someone else in a 12-step program oh you nobody know. but especially not somebody else in a 12-step yes okay yes. Right on. so with nick and dot not very happy about what's going on jeffrey and amy move out they begin to live living to, together and this is the same recipe for disaster that his biological parents tried decades before. Uh, Jeffrey and Amy wed within a few months, but they would find without a support system that life was full of temptations. And Jeffrey soon arrested for a drug charge, sending him back to prison for a year. It was here while in prison, Jeffrey is asked by another inmate if he's related to Daryl Hill, saying Jeffrey looked a lot like him, but Jeffrey denied it. Only because he doesn't know his father's first name, but soon yeah. realizes that Daryl must be his biological father. Wow. Jeffrey then went back to that inmate to get the full story of his father and found out that he is on death row in Arkansas. In 82, Jeffrey's released from prison and he returns to Amy. 
Uh, he and Amy got a condo that was rented for them by Nick and Dot. At least, you know, they were helping them a little bit there. And a few months later, Amy gets pregnant. And Jeffrey was really happy that he was going to be a father at 22 years old, just like his own father. Ugh. Um, around this same who is too young to be a parent. I'm oh, sorry. yes. Way too young. Well, especially <laughs> someone who is trying to recover from drug problems. Mm -hmm. um, someone that uh, it, it, it's, it's just it's too young. It's too young, period. Um, it was around this same time that Jeffrey found that a prison friend named Greg Brown had been released. and They reconnected at a party at someone's house. And they fell right back in their old habits. They were hanging out, having a good time and getting high. And then Jeffrey started to tease Greg about Greg being a punk. And this pisses Greg off because in prison culture, a punk is someone who's about to be sexually assaulted. Yes. So Greg tells you something completely different. In yes. This. Yes. <laughs> um, Greg told Jeffrey to step outside and Greg was apparently much bigger than Jeffrey. So on his way out the door, he grabbed a knife and put it in his pocket. Once outside, Jeffrey immediately attacked Greg and stabbed him over and over. Um, a man came running out with a gun, threatening to blow Jeffrey's head off. And Jeffrey books. He runs away. Uh, the police caught up with Jeffrey later that night. They arrested him for murder. And just like his father, Jeffrey is now a murderer at a very young age. Wow. On September 9th, 1985, Jeffrey is convicted of murder and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Uh, he learns that Amy has given birth to a daughter while he's in prison, and he's also served with divorce papers. Mm -hmm. While in prison, he's approached by an older man who is making sexual advancements to him. So Jeffrey pulls out a shiv and stabs the man with it like father, like son. Oh, wow. Uh, he's then placed into solitary confinement where he decides he's going to write his father. Uh, Daryl received the letter and was very confused, thinking all these years that his son, uh, you know, died in the fire. Yeah. So, uh, Daryl does write him back and they soon become pen pals. Uh, Daryl has become a born again Christian while he's in prison. He's off drugs. And so he's imploring his son to get his life together. Uh, through these letters, he also finds out uh, about his birth mother, Desiree, and finds out she's moved to Yuma, Arizona, where she's remarried and moved on with her life. So Jeffrey then becomes obsessed with finding his mother so he can ask why she gave him away. Yeah. So he writes to her, but she doesn't write back. And since she won't write back, he decides he will go to her and begins plotting his escape from prison. Wow. In 1989, Jeffrey has become a model prisoner. Uh, he's been placed in a minimum security pr prison and eventually put on a work detail outside the prison where he is put uh, into a park to pick up litter. Here he meets Angela Dante. Uh, Angela was a single mom with a young son, and she was looking for attention, which Jeffrey gave her. Uh, she got to know Jeffrey and really wanted to know when he was going to be back. And when she finds out, she makes sure she's back in the park on that day and continues to be there each time. This eventually leads to a sexual relationship, and Angela fell in love with Jeffrey and agreed to help him escape. Oh, nice. On November 11th, 1989, Angela waited outside the prison while Jeffrey escaped. Once they're gone, he tells her he wants to go a thousand miles away to meet his mom. Um, and Angela went with this for a couple of days and then she realized she was being used. So she kicked, kicked Jeffrey out of the car and she went back home. But Jeffrey is still determined to find his mom and begins hitchhiking to Yuma. She still aided in a, aided and abetted an escape from a prison. Sure. It's still a crime. Yeah. Uh, two weeks later, he wound up in Phoenix, Arizona. And the stress on being on the road, penniless and homeless uh, <clears throat> to get him through, he turned back to drugs, but for drugs, you needed money or someone who has drugs on December 13th, 1989, Jeffrey ran into a man named Chester Dyer, who was a gay bartender who routinely picked up men and Chester would often blow his entire paycheck, picking up men and often bringing them back to his apartment. Jeffrey saw Chester had money and thought he would be an easy mark. So he went with him thinking he was just going to steal the money. They went to Chester's apartment and they started hanging out, drinking and smoking pot. 
And then Chester called another friend and told him he had met someone named Jeff that he had over there and wanted to know if he wanted to come over and party. Chester then invited Jeffrey to his room, at which point Jeffrey attacked Chester by wrapping an electrical cord around his throat and tied it off until Chester went unconscious. Uh, Jeffrey then stabbed Chester with a screwdriver multiple times. And he began searching the house for valuables, and he came across a deck of cards with lewd pictures of men on them. He found the ace of hearts in the deck and placed it on Chester's back before scattering the rest of the cards around. When Chester failed to show up at work for two days, uh, his friend Grant Paris comes to Chester's apartment looking for him. And with no answer at the door, he used a credit card, Jimmy DeLock, and found Chester dead in his bedroom, at which point he called the police. Use a credit card. Yeah, this is definitely the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Uh, The police first thought that this was a robbery gone bad. However, with the lock not broken, they believe Chester may have known his murderer. And then Grant told police about his phone call to Chester two days prior and told them Chester had picked up someone named Jeff. Uh, Further investigation showed a perfect footprint left in a pile of sugar on the floor. So flyers are posted around uh, looking for more information while Jeffrey was still trying to find a way out of Phoenix. Uh, He had gotten money from Chester, but instead of using it to get to Yuma, he bought drugs. A few days later, on December 19th, Jeffrey decides to steal a car to get to Yuma. And unfortunately for Jeffrey, he picked the wrong car in the wrong place. Close by, there were two undercover officers who were sitting on a stakeout for an entirely different case. And they watched Jeffrey break into the car and then followed him to an abandoned house where Jeffrey was squatting. Um, Jeffrey's arrested there, taken to the police department where he's charged with car theft and trespassing, but it was during the processing <clears throat> that the cops noticed Jeffrey's shoes and remembered the flyer about a guy named Jeff in the size 10 Adidas snicker, sneakers, just like Jeffrey was wearing. So they began questioning him and Jeffrey denied ever even knowing Chester Dyer. But at the questioning, the detective asked why Jeffrey was wearing Chester's shirt, at which point Mm -hmm. Jeffrey realized he was busted. So he came clean, sort of. Uh, He admitted to being there when Chester was killed, but blamed the murder on a guy named Daryl for doing the actual murder. He did say he'd beaten Chester after Chester made sexual advances towards him, but he did not kill him. Police did not believe him and charged Jeffrey with Chester's murder. On June 25th, 1990, Jeffrey was put on trial. Uh, The evidence was so overwhelming uh, that his uh, that uh, he was even denied. uh, Excuse me. He was denied bail and his parents couldn't even get him out of this one. They had flown to Phoenix to be character witnesses for their son. But Jeffrey said, you know, just go away. I don't need you. Mm. On November 9th, 1990, Jeffrey is found guilty of the murder of Chester Dyer. And during the sentencing, he turned towards the judge and said, I think if you want to give me the death penalty, just bring it on. I'm ready for it. Uh, Jeffrey and Daryl became the only father and son on death row. And on October 26, 2010, Jeffrey Landgren was executed at 1026 p.m. According to the Arizona Republic, Jeffrey offered his last words in a strong voice and a heavy accent from his native Oklahoma, quote, well, I'd like to say thank you to uh, to my family for being here and to all my friends. Boomer Sooner. There you go, Hope. <laughs> uh, Daryl Hill died of natural causes uh, while on death row on December 8th, 2005. He was the longest uh, serving prisoner on death row at 24 years in Arkansas. Um, and the strange thing is to go along with possible DNA of violence, Jeffrey also had a grandfather who was shot to death by police while robbing a drugstore. And that's the story of Jeffrey Landrigan. Wow. Okay. So I guess there's something to be said about nature versus nurture, but man, I, I have a hard time thinking that it's a, a, a bad seed kind of thing. Yeah, I know. But in this particular case, it sure does seem like it was just bad DNA after bad DNA. Yeah. You know, and, and, and how Jeffrey and Daryl's lives really mirrored each other even though they never knew each other no they never met you know Mm. 
So yeah, kind of a bad one. So I did, ha- I did decide to do some positive notes for the day. So I decided to focus on some fun facts from the city of Phoenix. Pahonix. Since we spent some time there today. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, a resident of Phoenix on September 21st, 1981, uh, September 25th, 1981, became the first female justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. Yay, Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, the Phoenix Zoo, which operated, opened in 1962, is the largest privately owned nonprofit zoo in the United States. Nice. The Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix houses approximately 16,000 instruments from over 200 countries. Uh, there is a mysterious bat cave in Phoenix where thousands of Mexican free-tailed bats gather to rest and sleep during the day and flock back to their destination during the night. Uh, did you know that Phoenix, Arizona has more land designated for parks and preserves than any other major city in the country? I did not. Uh, Greater Phoenix has become one of the top golf destinations in the world, thanks to its almost 200 golf courses. Uh, the largest collection of desert plants can be found in Phoenix's Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, the Hall of Flame has the world's largest collection of firefighting equipment. <laughs> Hall of Flame. Very nice. Good pun. (laughs) While Phoenix is 75 miles from its nearest lake, Arizona once had a Navy. At its peak, the fleet had two vessels. Uh, This was formed to defend against a possible invasion by California. Okay. Uh, A possible invasion from California. Okay. Is Uh this a joke? No, no, this is real. Uh, There is a hidden unmarked speakeasy bar above the stock and stable restaurant at 5538 North 7th Street. You enter through a fire escape at the back of the building or a mock freezer in the restaurant's kitchen. Uh, Rock music icon Alice Cooper attended Cortez High School in Phoenix. He lives in Paradise Valley and leads a nonprofit charity called Solid Rock, which serves inner city Arizona teens. Uh, My sister Shelly has pointed out his house. Nice. Stevie Nicks, singer and songwriter of Fleetwood Mac fame, was born in Phoenix. Her father was president of the Amor Dial, Dial Soap Consumer Products Company that was moved from Chicago to Phoenix in 1971. The westernmost battle of the U.S. Civil War was fought just 48 miles southeast of Phoenix at Pikachu Peak on April 15th, 1862. Uh, greatness here. Wonder Woman TV star Linda Carter was born in Phoenix in 1951. She lived her childhood in Globe, Arizona. Nice. It is illegal to hunt camels in the state of Arizona. Yes. (laughs) And on two occasions in the 1930s, Phoenix got an inch of snow. The only time in the last 25 years that a measurable amount of snow was recorded from December 21st to 22nd, 1990, when 0.4 inches of snow was measured in Phoenix. Nice. And that's my story for today. Well, thank you, sir. Awesome. Great stuff. So that'll take us to the end of a recording week. Hope everybody's enjoyed it. Uh, Do hope everybody did uh, get a chance to listen to our bonus crossover episode. I know that was weeks ago for many of you, but if you haven't listened to it, please do make sure to listen to it. We had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hopefully we'll be doing some more in the future. Oh, I hope so as well. It was great. Uh, if you would go to nerderyandmurdery.com, you can find the links to all of our social media as well as our contact information, where if you want to let us know things you like, let us know things you don't like. We're happy to listen to all of those. Yes, we will listen. You can also find the link to our merchandise on our page. We do have some new merchandise out there, so do please check that out. Uh, you can also find the link to our Patreon, where if you wish to uh, to help donate to the show to keep us going, we do appreciate all of our patrons. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. Um, you can, though, help us out by making sure to give a five-star rating and review at iTunes. Uh, that really helps our show, helps get our content out there to other people, and is something free and only takes just a minute or two to help us out. Yes. Please and thank you. Please and thank you again. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdering. Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs>